and we are live welcome to a supplemental i almost said welcome back but this is a supplemental episode of the geek book club where we had to have some special guests on we had a few technical difficulties some hangouts related issues some audio related issues but we are broadcasting live finally and we're going to dig into uh we're, we're going to revisit our conversation from reviewing the book altered carbon and now share some of our thoughts about the adaptation that uh the tv show that netflix produced uh a, a, a story by the same name but with many differences from the word on the written page joining me as always for my geeky bookie clubby discussions is mr andrew wallace at fat produce on twitter how's it going buddy boy oh uh, it's going pretty good how about yourself this is, this is fantastic <laughs> so, so andrew i'm just going to cut you off right there i normally very much value what you have to say and the things that you add to the discussion but just just shut up because we've got two guests. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't help that. I just. I don't feel our shows are hostile enough. So I <laughs> wanted to see if we could engage in more conflict. No, joining us this week, we've got uh, two of my favorite people to geek out with about cinema and comic books. I am speaking, of course, of none other than Mr. Anabong Etta from Board at Work and Mr. Board Buddha Lou Rod, also uh, joining uh, Anabong on a lot of their comic book and uh, cinema franchise discussions. Uh, both of you gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on uh, the Geek Book Club. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for having me as well. Definitely. So, it'll be fine. So, it's gonna be fine. So I, I want to jump right in. So we we spent uh, it was actually one of our longest podcasts talking about the first book of the, of the Takeshi Kovac uh, series, a, a three book series uh, starting off with the book Altered Carbon. And now we have a TV show from Netflix. And the first thing that I kind of want to throw out there, especially Lou, your take on this is TV now the way to go for a proper adaptation uh, before we jumped on air you were talking about how you were a couple hours into the audiobook for ready player one and i think a lot of us have concerns with taking really popular novels and trying to cram them into the two hours we'd get for a future film yeah i said i didn't read this book so i listened to that podcast enjoyed it very much <laughs> i think tv is the way to go for certain novels and books honestly, because you could tell the story better and you're not forced to at best a two and a half hour medium, unless you're someone like Peter Jackson, who's going to give you a two hour and 35 minute movie and then extend it to almost three hours for his first movie. Or for, for, build what, that for the Hobbit, Hobbit turning one book into a trilogy of films that were then oh. each three hours long. Yeah, that one. That's another one I didn't read the book on, but I enjoyed the movies, <laughs> the extended versions. I always enjoy the extended versions better than the theater cuts because it just tells more story. Definitely. So, but, so and and uh, and Thunder E, uh, Anabong, do do you think that this is going to become the more desirable place for filmmakers to try and experiment with? Because w even for Altered Carbon, it's not like they didn't compress parts of this book, change a number of the plot points and plot devices. There's still significant change. This is still an adaptation. It's not it's not like taking a short story like Shawshank Redemption, where you can almost read the story along with the movie that like it's so close one to one translation. But just like we've seen with a number of uh, film producers uh, that TV is becoming a more exciting place to tell stories. Do you think that adaptations now are, are you're going to find more talent making their way to the small screen? Oh, I think so. I think definitely it is. Um, you talked about Ready Player One. And remember, on my own podcast, I I had that epiphany when I said I watched the last trailer and I felt like mm -hmm. this is not going to be the book that I just finished rereading totally. again. Yeah. Um, and also Carbon, I haven't read the book, but I will be reading it. Uh, I watched the show and it reminded me of a, a book series that I just finished last year, which is the Commonwealth Saga. Yeah. Um, and that is such an extensive world. And yes, they're gonna be cuts and breakdowns and compressions, but TV still allows you to tell the story in the breath that I think some of these books require. You know, uh, especially like Alter Carbon, because uh, I, I guess we can get into that later. Because there, I heard from some some of my friends who said, "Wow, the first episode was so condensed." Even though for yeah. me, I, for me, I went, "That is just 
classic sci-fi. You know? <laughs> so. Well, actually, because because Andrew, that's that's precisely and thank you, Anabong. It's like you host your own show, so you know exactly where my transitions need to be. Um, Andrew, I wanted to throw it to you because we spent so much time talking about the book when you had only watched, I think, the second episode. It was, yeah, I had gotten through to the second episode by the time so, we had, so by the time we how, how do you feel that they managed some of the pacing in altered carbon in 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 at least trying to convey the same sense of not only world building but then also the detective story? Hmm. Definitely the world like it was it was nice to be able to show rather than uh, the world building rather than have you know in the book it's it, they more have to kind of describe what's what's around you they 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 flushed it out a lot more especially earlier on some core concepts that helped you keep track as uh, you know as as the story got more complex as it went along mm -hmm. um it really it, i had pro some problems with other aspects that we'll get into as far as pacing and and oh and, i'm sure we all did oh yeah <laughs> But I, overall, I think it handled it. It handled it pretty well as far as the detective side goes. That I got, I, I, I lost a little bit of that. Uh, it mm -hmm. felt, it, a lot of that got replaced with uh, the one scene that comes to mind is the what was it? They had the the weightless gladiatorial right. fight, zero just to G shoot. fight. Yeah, yeah. They had this whole this whole ball that they made up that this party that wasn't in the book, from what I remember that this their core was to show how nasty these people these rich you know immortal people are but you know, at the expense of having the noir mystery detective you know the side that i got out of the book can, can so, i jump in there for a second yeah Ooh, I absolutely can yeah i i see i disagree with you granted i haven't read the book but i, <laughs> I it, because i think the mystery noir so for instance like i said to me this show reminds me of uh the Commonwealth Saga. The problem is all those mystery nor parts don't necessarily revolve well against audiences of today. Audiences of today like a lot of things spelt out for them, which is why I had to argue with a friend of mine who said that first episode was good condensed. And I said, no, it's just classic sci-fi. They expect you to have a brain and understand certain concepts. If they tell you human beings can be downloaded to souls, let's move forward. But I think that whole fight scene was needed because you really want to show how depraved uh, the sense of mort immortality plays along with a certain group of people in this world. Because that scene extends to the very last two episodes as well of the show. And, and that's what you want. Users want to have that connection that ties forward. So that's why I just said, you know, I was going to just disagree there. That's, well, that's a good I mean, point. obviously yeah, you're both point. wrong, and I'll weigh in later and tell you <laughs> what the right opinion is to have. But no, th this is this is one of the things that I think is really interesting in why I'm where I would be probably I, I am actually a bit more critical of some of the abbreviations and shortcuts that have taken place in a show like The Expanse. Um, for how much I loved, how much fun I had with that first book. They're introducing story elements in the in the show. In a, in a different way than the way that the story unravels and is is uh, delivered to the reader. For Altered Carbon, I think one of the reasons why I'm, I'm giving it just a little bit more room is that classic debate that we have. And this actually goes to a comment that we just got in the live chat from Gansey Tech Nerd. Why adapt and modify the written stories rather than replicate? Is it because of attracting viewership alone? And I think you do have a philosophical question that you need to explore when you take a written story and you turn it into visual moving images, there is so much explanation and exposition that can happen in text that would be tragically dull if we just sort of replicated that one to one for mm -hmm. a movie audience or for a TV audience. And so what we need to do are find those find those opportunities where we can show rather than tell. Action is always going to be more satisfying in an adaptation than some sort of passive voice or narration or other other form of exposition. Yep. So I think I'm willing to give Altered Carbon just that little bit more leash on something like the depravity of the Methuselah community, the, these old people that just are sort of hellbent on not dying ever. Um, because I think it's more satisfying to show us their depravity rather than 
have people discuss what terrible things they've done in in a past tense or a passive voice. Um, mm -hmm. But we should probably really quickly just kind of touch on the the main core story elements that are the same from the book and the show, uh, where we have uh, the, a, an individual by the name of Takashi Kovach, and he's the the singular figure for three books. Uh, he's the main character. He's our sort of you know, uh, shades of gray, dark, gritty, anti-hero protagonist. And uh, he, he is, this is a society, as, as uh, Annabong mentioned, where you can download your consciousness into a little chip that lives at the base of your skull. And so if your corporeal form is damaged, they just take the information off that chip, they download you into a new body, and you can keep on going. And there are a lot of commentaries, both in the book and the show, about, like, uh, the... the uh, uh, the disparity in wealth, for example, there are some people who over generations of time have become immensely wealthy and powerful. And then there are a whole group of people who can barely afford to actually live in the real world, let alone ever get re-downloaded into a new body. And so Takeshi is downloaded into this uh, this augmented male body, which has some sort of combat uh, sort of adaptations. And he uh, he is tasked with unraveling the murder of one of these meths, uh, not meths because they're addicted to amphetamines. It's short for Methuselah, a reference to the Bible, you know, really long lived individual. And so this individual believes that he was murdered, even though all of the evidence points to him having committed suicide. So he enlists the aid of this contractor, this former military uh, specialist who was a member of what they call the Envoy Corps. And then the entire noir part of the story unravels as we get into the seamy underbelly of wealth and privilege and high class society in a future where your actual physical body doesn't really mean much. And I think on the whole, the thing I wanna start with with you guys and, and coming back to you, Lou, um, we, we were, we were off air talking about another show that's going to be coming to Netflix, uh, uh, lost in space is going to be coming to Netflix soon too. And how this, the name of that show doesn't instill a lot of confidence in sci-fi and TV fans. You know, it's kind of a hokey throwback to classic, you know, 19, what, 1950s, 1960s television. But then we saw the trailer and like, oh, we're actually getting more excited about this. This is definitely an area where I think Netflix is crushing it, where I don't think anyone would disagree that the production design, the character design, the uh, the lighting, the cinematography, the, the, the music, the sound editing, I thought Altered Carbon was an amazingly beautifully produced yes. uh, mm -hmm. uh, show to, to consume. Honestly, I felt like if you were in this, watching a movie. Mm-hmm, definitely. I mean... <sighs> All the Netflix shows that I've watched down to the Marvel ones are shot beautifully. Yeah. I don't know who they're hiring to do their <laughs> cinematography. Well, I, I don't know. Who. I, mean, I, 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 I can tell you words at the I, end of the episode. <laughs> I, I can quickly tell you it's the same cinematographer that did Daredevil season one and two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It shows. Uh, yeah. I, I will say my one of my favorite visual styling stylizations that they did with this was was uh whenever you went into virtual and they had the 360 degree camera uh mm -hmm, to, yeah. you know the same sort of things when you're looking at if you you cast you know a 360 degree video to your television and you get that full view just in the in the rectangle yeah it was oh. that kind of ultra wide is it sort of like bending your brain around an environment that doesn't really exist which it, it, Little touches like that that help us move back and forth. And again, really simple visual cues in ushering the audience through changes in the storytelling. I mean, I mean, just think about how clumsy we've done that in the past. Like, this is sort of a wetware. There's so much of this world where I feel Richard K. Morgan is trying to find the new voice of like a cyberpunk movement. Um, taking like a William Gibson novel and making it more about wetware than just, you know, like computer hacking and stuff like that. And I, we, you look back on films that used to employ those types of transitions all the way back to like the lawnmower man. How do you get 
the audience to join you into a magical digital world. And it's just so hamstrung getting you through that. And here, Altered Carbon, it's like we take these transitions for granted because they're so beautifully, simply produced and they're so amazingly well done. Yeah, mm-hmm. Like I was telling E in one of our previous shows, they spent money. <laughs> <laughs> they spent money because yeah, they most of these worlds are all CGI. Mm-hmm. They didn't build no practical sets for a lot of this stuff. So, and Lost in Space is looking like that too, with the exception of when they're on that planet. So Netflix is out there spending money yeah, because and they're I mean, producing. Even, no, I mean, because even for how much we now take these types of storytelling elements for granted, I mean, look at network shows in the year 2018 where you can still see bad comping. You know, mm-hmm. like we had to film this outside of like a, a major outdoor green screen. And then we've like layered in a cityscape or a national monument in the background. Oh, yeah. And we see terrible. We see that a lot with the CW shows. <laughs> yeah. That is very true. I, I think I think one of the things to point out, especially with the production quality, and you got to give hats off to HBO, especially with oh, yeah. how how they set Game of Thrones as a key standard. That look, if you put the money into it, and I think that's also one thing that helped Altered Carbon. One of the things you know, one of my favorite sci-fi movies from last year was uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Mm-hmm. And, you know, watching the show reminded me of Blade Runner in, you know, just in many, many respects, but but visually reminded me of it because they took their time to to map out the world, to show you the, you, you knew the difference between the underbelly and the high class. You, even though they didn't really, you know, I guess you could say there was, I call it budgetary constraints, but you understood when they went to a different planet and they talked about different worlds as opposed to just Earth itself, where you know most of the show took place. So those kind of things, um, I think, helped create the atmosphere for for what the show was going to be. To say, okay, this is taking you to this very different um, sci-fi realm. Because I think for a lot of viewers, you know, just from telling friends about the show and they go, oh yeah, your soul can be downloaded to a chip. They're like, huh, what? You know, that I think that's one of the things that they, the visuals help you get to that point quickly if you're not into that realm of sci-fi where you can go, okay, this is the future. It's like a hundred and how many or 20 years in the future, but you download your soul into a chip and then you can move from body to body body I, I i guess you know so those kind of things i think helped move the show forward where a lot of people could could now get into it and start watching as all well and and it, it came at the right time because i mean if we think about the number of times that we've seen similar uh, storytelling devices utilized in tv it's taken that show a long time to explain the magic of their sci-fi i i i I was watching i was reading altered carbon and i just kept thinking about how many missed opportunities we had in a show like dollhouse where it's a very similar storytelling trick you know you you can load your consciousness into a giant hard drive and then swap that out you can store people you can put them on ice you can you can sort of uh attack people digitally like in in both the show and the book there's this notion of like a a virus style attack that can happen to your stack that stores your consciousness and you can kind of kill like real kill real death someone that way and and what are the things i appreciated about the show and I think it's why so many people have had issues. Uh, we uh, we got a comment from uh, Jason Million. Uh, he, and like, I liked Altered Carbon as you get more into the season. The show does something very similar into the book in that it just sort of trusts that you're, you're game for a 10-hour film. The, the mm-hmm. book doesn't hold yeah. your hand through the explanation of this world. There's no 
exposition. There's no kindly old scientist who comes out with a PowerPoint presentation to explain what's going on. It, it just starts lobbing the vernacular at you. It just starts talking about new digital brain chemicals and you're know, like, oh, and someone got their neck blown off. Oh, I guess he's really dead. And, and it takes a little while. I think it takes a good two or three chapters. For me, it took me a good two or three chapters until I had wrapped my brain around um so, sort of that vernacular and storytelling device andrew do you think that that's maybe one of the issues that people are having with the tv show is the tv show does something very similar and it just sort of throws you into the deep end of what this world has to offer yeah i mean they tried to kind of the, the first episode is a, is the one of the worst examples of how they they just kind of shoved the explanation of how stacks work in your face super super blatantly and then it just drops off and you're just kind of along for it um i mean i think they did a little bit better job of of ha showing the vernacular and 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 showing its relationship to everything else uh, as you can with a phone uh but i mean it's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, don't, don't put any punches there, Andrew. <laughs> tell us how you really feel. I mean, I, I mean, I, I would be the contrary, and I said they did an excellent job. I always, I've always said this, and Lou knows very well. I consider audiences today to be very—they like handholding. I don't. Yeah. So for me, for a TV show that it just told me what stacks were. It's called definition. Just put it in your head, and I. I to me, I like that because I don't want to always go back and go, well, stacks, remember, you know, like some other person explaining stacks again. It's like watching a movie where they explained a superhero's power like four or five times. You know, like, yeah. I, I don't need that. But I get it. Maybe you needed maybe a little bit more at some point. Um, but I think I did enjoy the fact that I... It, it, it felt like a novel at the very beginning because it felt like, okay, whoa, what is this? I mean, in, in, for me, it was easier because I just finished reading the Commonwealth Saga, so literally the same concepts, and I was like, <laughs> let's go. Let's um, it. <laughs> but it still felt like a novel where you go, okay, so there's stacks, there's real death, and then, uh, but you can switch bodies, but you have to acclimatize, and you're like, what are all these different things? So there's some of that there, and maybe they needed one more explanation. I give them one extra explanation. That's it. That's it done. No more. <laughs> can can do well, multiple because because you know there there is a risk. I, I when I look at some of my favorite science fiction films, uh, you know, like I I love showing people films like Primer because that that movie is I think that you you talk about the spectrum. There are movies where there are movies and TV shows where the producers are holding the audience's hand and spoon feeding them every tiny little baby step through the plot, and then there are films where you get nothing. <laughs> I think primer is at the bookend, uh, you know, at the, at the extreme of that. Here is very complex scientific discussion of time travel as a mechanic, and we're not going to help you at all. So if you didn't pay attention to six frames of film, you're probably going to get lost. So the danger, or I feel the risk for that, that kind of storytelling. And I think this is my hypothesis. I think this is one of the reasons why the initial response to the Netflix altered carbon was so tepid was because the show really is trusting the audience to go along with them for that ride. I think one of the major questions, and, I, and Lou, I'd like to pose this one to you first, is do you feel that they capitalized on this risk? Do you feel like you get to the end of the series and that your investment at the beginning was worth paying attention to all of those little nuances. Do they really pay it off? I think so. Like I said, I, I pay attention to the detail when I watch a show and then I'll go back and rewatch it. Well, because to see if I missed something else. Because you, so, you were saying that be before we even kicked on, like you went back and watched. I I went back and watched a couple episodes, a couple key episodes. I actually didn't. I was going to, but then oh, you <laughs> I used my time wisely to listen to Ready Player One. <laughs> I, I'm not going to fault anyone for not rewatching Altered Carbon to go and listen to the audio book for Ready Player One. Do yeah. that. That's good too. I'm not. I'm not going to fault but, you there. Because it was. It's still somewhat fresh in my mind because it was that good. When yeah. something that good, I remember it. Like, I didn't need to be, I don't like a show that spoon feeds me. Yeah. Because when a, sh a show spoon feeds me, I lose interest. 
Well, it feels like there's a lot of wasted time. Uh huh. This one to me, I didn't feel no wasted time. Cause granted, I didn't even know it was a book. <laughs> so I got into it. I'm like, all right, this is pretty interesting. I like this concept of, you know, you could live forever, but you could be stuck with a body you might not want, yeah. but you get to live. You know, the like the running joke was you got the little girl who mm-hmm. got the 70 year old lady yeah. body. Oh, that's such a sad moment, too. Yeah. And it's great that they just throw it away like they do. No, you see, and, 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 and that's the thing. I like that moment at the very beginning because immediately I went, because, you know, he offered her a cigarette mm-hmm. when yeah. they were both sitting next to each other. And next minute she goes, Mommy. And I was like, Huh? <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Whoa. Yeah. Oh. I was like, This world is cruel. They're evil people in this place. Let's keep watching. <laughs> and then you go, I don't remember the exact episode where she brings her grandmother to the Day of the Dead holiday. That was nice. I really liked the insight we got into Ortega, the added insight that we didn't really get in the book, uh, uh, in the sh- that, that we got in the show. Uh, like, the like I posed before we started, people complained about the whitewashing of the show. Did you get that same sentiment in the book? Was Kovach white or Asian? He, Andrew, I'm going to let you start off because I have some very strong feelings on this and I'll be confused. He, well, originally Kovach wasn't wasn't Caucasian on Harlan's world because I remember when whenever they we first meet him in Riker's sleeve, he said at the beginning of the book they talk about how he's he's forties and Caucasian, which was a change for him. So, so like it, I found it, the show's depiction to be at, kind of, rather accurate from what I imagined it to be. Um, and I was mean like, you know, just check your privilege and <laughs> okay. Can, can, can I can I jump in? Can I jump in? And help? <laughs> yeah. This is supposed and, to be telling more corny and, jokes and, and help out here. I mean, look, for me personally, I liked it because it, it just reminded me of what that world was, right? You know, especially to me, there was a subconscious writing there that said. Who was who was the rich guy again that uh, that revived him? What was his name? Uh, Bancroft? Bancroft. Bancroft. Bancroft did that on purpose. To me, I just felt that was what it was. I'm not giving you original body, even if I can find it. I'm giving you what I want. Yes. And you should oh, yeah. do this. So well, for me, for me, it wasn't was, whitewashing. It was more of less like this is what rich people do. It was stated though when he did that, he did it to get back at Ortega. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So exactly. So, so for me, that was. It wasn't whitewashing, it was just very practical. And plus, it's a world where if you don't have money, you don't get your body. Let's just, just be frank. Like, you just don't. Yeah. So, I, example, I was, yeah. the 70 year old lady in the yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, well, and also, they didn't really touch on this in the series, but like uh, with the synth, synth sleeves, uh, you know, you could have them be augmented, but also there are really crappy synth sleeves that that, yeah. you, get, that you know everything tasted like sawdust, and you're it's all you never it's get the taste the taste buds right. It's the always save best choice brand sleeve that you can get, you know, at the at the Dollar General. Right. <laughs> so, so Dollar here's, here's one of the things that that I had a little difficulty with. Uh, in some of the discussion about this, I mean, so so when you brought up whitewashing. There's one thing I think I could appreciate if we were in a different political climate. Um, what's the name of the actor who plays uh, this uh, Joel Kinnaman? Yeah. Oh, so, the 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 wannabe president in House of Cards. Yeah, exactly. And and, and the the reboot from RoboCop again. Like I really like this guy's work. I, I think he's a phenomenal actor. What we absolutely never ever would have wanted an actor like Kinnaman to do is try and adopt Asian mannerisms because he's got the consciousness of someone who was originally born in an Asian body. That absolutely would have been terrible. <laughs> like, yeah, and he did it. And, and he he did. Did. So the producers completely avoided that as being part of the character, the commentary. And I think it was absolutely the safest way to, but, to, to go through uh, adapting the story. I think one thing they also mentioned that in, in the in the in the show, uh, I remember the first time when he he had when he left his body as a kid, 
So the one thing I like, this is also, well, I'm sidetracking myself again, but there's one thing there in the show did that this, this small nuggets they threw in that to me shocked me when he was recruited by the whatever force that they have. Mm-hmm. Uh, the department. They, yeah, the, the intergalactic cops. Um, <laughs> when he was recruited by them, he was recruited at the age of like 10, 11, something like that, then maybe 12. He was young. And then he was going to leave his body and jump into a grown man. Now, most people flew by that. And I was like, that is the cruelest shit you will ever do. <laughs> because the episode, there was a couple of episodes before that where he, you know, he jumped back into his real body after you know going on missions for a while. And they said something there. They were like, you know, he was getting used to his own body again. Mm-hmm. And that's why the mannerisms don't come into play because you have to get used to the body that you're in, not necessarily well, your mannerisms per se. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a and play. He, with that this is one of the beautiful aspects of the way that they've that that Richard Morgan wrote this character is that as being one of these envoy, one of these special forces type characters, it was his job. His entire life was built around jumping into bodies as efficiently and as quickly as possible, acclimating, getting the lay of the land, doing recon and operating with tactical efficiency as quickly as possible. And so I think there would be very little sense of his original biological creation Mm -hmm. as being a a man of Asian descent, vaguely human, humanic Asian descent. It's kind of like to me when um, in the expanse, where Martians speak with what we assume is like a Texan or Western accent. And it's coming out. They describe one of the characters as being Asian. But of course, in, in the show, they depict him as being um, Indian, like from India. Yeah. And you're like, well, yeah, that's also a part of Asia. But with a Texan accent. Yeah. yeah. With a Texan uh, accent. But because they, it... they weren't raised in India on Earth, the, those mannerisms and that personality and, 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 those characteristics would be different. And so Takeshi in being this type of, this is the one thing I think is actually kind of limiting about the show is they go through showing us the backstory of the envoy, the, this core of guerrilla like warriors. And um, they don't ever show us Takeshi jumping into other bodies. It's only <laughs> Takeshi in his original body and Takeshi in Kinnaman's body. No, no, three. No, he would jump into three bodies. What was the other one? Yeah, yeah. So, th- you know, when he was captured, that was a different guy. It was not him. When he was captured? When he was captured by the Galaxy Police, where they shot the the woman he was with. So, you remember, he had gone on a mission, and they had stolen a bunch of stacks. And I, that wasn't that sure. his original that body? His original no, body. Yeah. trust me, it wasn't his original body. Watch it again. Well, it was because it remember was not. The it's a different actor. Now. It's a different actor. It's not his original body. Hmm. And let me. <laughs> I know, no, I'm, I'm curious I'm right now because you just <laughs> dropped a bomb. Because I assumed. Um, now, now watch me. You know, like, uh, oh, all Asian people look alike. Uh, <laughs> one, 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 one thing I'll say that's a key difference. Uh, while we're talking about the envoys, the big key difference between the book and and the show is is everything, pretty much everything around the on, uh, envoys, except for the capabilities. That's all spot on. But they weren't any part of any part of a resistance against the, is it the protectorate yeah the protectorate uh they were part of the protectorate they were like their elite shock troops this is so, all completely different yeah yeah completely and and i had some problems with some char- with character choices which we can get into later but uh and a lot some of that revolves around what the show chose as as the the main uh i guess love interest for for uh kovach it wasn't it was it wasn't quite like that in the book. But... You mean o- Ortega? No, 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 the envoy. The envoy, the envoy woman. woman. The one, um, the one who trained them. Yes, yes, because there was there was no romantic subplot. Of course, there was also no sister either. So, like that, that all was very different. But there was no also, sister. No sister. Well, th- it was it well, was the equivalent character, but they were not related. See my face, no sister. Yeah, yeah. No. The, the, I, I, I love the fact that she was the villain. I really yeah, love it. Spreads this stuff out very strangely. So you know, it, it's it's little it's little things. Like I don't think it's terribly tragic that um, Kel, 
uh, is mm. being her stack is the one that Rylene is trying to hold hostage in the show. In the book, it's this Sarah character. It's the woman he's shot with at the very beginning of the very first episode. Yeah, and she didn't get her stack blown out in the book. So. Yeah. So for no good reason, like there's just this woman that he seems to care about, but she's not mentioned at all in the book. <laughs> it's just suddenly at the very end, Rylene's like, oh, and I've got Sarah's stack. <laughs> and <laughs> Takeshi seems to care about that, but you know, it doesn't really mean anything to the audience. Um, so it means a lot more actually to have someone like Kel. And and in the in the book, um, what is the name? It's Virginia. Uh, okay. oh, I just had v that. Vidura? Is that? I think that's how you pronounce her name. Anyway, so Kel is actually this like ancient, almost mythological figure that wrote about all of this philosophy. She wasn't the one who trained Takeshi. There was this other character, Virginia Vidura, that they just sort of combined. So Kel becomes sort of the amalgamation of like three or four different characters from the book. And that actually works better because you have a okay, lot so of it's a Game of Thrones scenario. It don't know. It totally is. And and because you have a lot of I, I think you have a few wasted characters in the book, characters that don't mean anything that appear in one scene, disappear for most of the book, come back at a later time. Uh, Rylene has a has sort of an assassin assistant named uh, Trep in, mm. in the book, which is then also combined with another character to form the weird little guy who asks if everyone's a believer before he. OK, the ghost. Them. The, the ghost character in, in the TV show. Again, that helps abbreviate us through just sort of what would have been a fog of individual one-off characters. I think that's something Richard Morgan was very inefficient with, was he had no problems. He had no issues at all introducing a character just to fill one plot moment and then moving on with the book. And maybe that character comes back or maybe they don't. Um, the show actually, I think, does a good job of piecemealing, stapling together some of these ideas so that the audience doesn't have to learn a whole bunch of different people. They stay focused. And when something happens, like when we see Kel, that Kel might, her stack might be held hostage, that means way more to us than if out of the blue, I mean, just imagine if you'd gotten to like episode nine and they had said, oh yeah, you know that woman who got shot to hell in episode one in the first like 10, 10 minutes of the, of the episode? Oh, we've got her right here. You haven't seen her. You haven't heard from her in eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> TV. Oh, but here she is. Wouldn't have well, meant anything to us. What they did was actually intriguing with the show because the sister, you felt for her pain and his pain together because of the father abuse. Mm -hmm. And then how he sent, he took them to the envoy when she really didn't want to go, but she followed him anyway. And then how she betrayed his love interest from the very first, well, his envoy trainer. And and again, you know, so I mean, like, and, and that's more satisfying, right? I mean, just like what you were saying, you were saying, E, it's more satisfying when there's some kind of relationship. And the book does this really gimmicky thing where they they dance around, oh, yes, me and Rylene have history. But they never explain yeah. it. It's just she's another meth and she hates Takeshi and Takeshi hates Rylene, but they sort of wink around. Oh, it's a it's a mysterious story with lots of twists and turns and intrigue. And we hate each other, but we're not going to tell you what that story is. We're just yeah. going to fight. But the, the only real inkling we get into Kawahara's character it, uh, and how they know each other from the past uh, back in Harlan's world was they taught there was a story about how um, what the old mob bosses would do or yakuza bosses would go do uh, to people who uh, were either going to punish them or owe them money was they go and and uh, make them drink contaminated water and kawahara as a little girl was one of these water runners so she, and she, so she would go and collect this contaminated water and bring it to the yakuza and that was something like she was proud of and so that was like that was about the the largest inkling we had for kawahara's character in the book um I had some problems with motivate with some with uh, her in particular in the show, um, but you know it's it, at least there's a little more depth to her character in the show. Actually, a lot well, more. Depth. What, what were some of those problems you had, Andrew? <laughs> like, uh, I'm put you on the spot because well, it was perfect. <laughs> 
the the for one i had some issues with her motivation like what why she was so insanely crazy <clears throat> about about getting with having kobash to the point of insanity like you know it's like over the top it kind of became mustache twirling like to a point where whatever she would do anything include destroy him to have him with her which didn't really make sense to me uh, that's that twisted sister love. No, I, I agree with that. I think it, it is because she's immortal. It doesn't oh. matter. You remember, you gotta, you gotta add that in. It does not matter. I will have this as long as possible. It's, this, there's no time limit. Th this is one of the things again, again, because I don't feel we got as much exploration of some of those things, like not getting to see Rileen and Tack jump into more bodies or we didn't get to see more of because we got like kind of the the good backstory on the envoy right they they dedicated an entire episode almost kind of battlestar galactica style where we're gonna yeah. rewind let you just see a little bit more of the envoy that we've been teasing but we didn't get quite as much of ray and i think just some of the interim when takeshi is captured and he's been put on ice and he he's um because he, he's at a commission for 200 years? Is that how long in the show he's been put? I think it was 350. No, it's 250. So it's uh, 250. Yeah. Two to 300 years. There's a two to 300 year window of uh, Ray's character that we don't get. Like, we don't yeah. really get any of that. And I think even just some little moment or some little uh, expository flashback would have helped us. Because because right now, because I, mean, I can kind of appreciate where you're coming from, Andrew. There's this massive sort of Electra complex, this brother love, sister love thing happening mm -hmm. that I think the, her, the, her quest to get him out of this storage, uh, out of this like sort of police storage situation might have been a little bit better informed if we had seen some of the struggles she went through to become a meth and then to become powerful and then to try and get her brother freed. Uh, yeah, I, I hear you. A oh, quick one, though. I found all the actors who played Takeshi Kovac. Uh, Joe Killerman, of course, who is the main one. Uh, the second guy is Will Unli, who is the who is basically the main one everyone thinks about. And the third actor is Byron Mann. Um, he is the he was the he was the um, Holy basically crud, the, the right. body that. Um, fought against them in the ring. Yeah, you're right. Oh, Attention. Yeah. Good. Well, then he had four. Little kid body. Yeah, I guess oh, you could call yeah. it. But, yeah. but also, I, 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 still, I still hold to my previous assessment, though. It would have been nice to see to catch other, the, other, other in, bodies. As well. in, in other bodies. So, I mean, like, there are so many of these operate. They take us to two of them, and I think they do something that's a little bit of a TV cheat where you see the these human bodies are sort of hooked up to these machines with electrodes on the brain and they know that they're wire casting that or needle casting sorry that's yeah. their fancy way of saying we're beaming your consciousness into another body across it's, the solar system or across this call it super 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 like tenji or whatever you want to call it <laughs> yeah um but then they never show us that conflict they never show us the conflict of them in other bodies on another planet and this is one thing that I think is also kind of kind of TV magic hokey. I know this is the only way that they could kind of get their way out of it, but it's another one of the differences between the book and, and the show is during the climactic finale, this is this is a humongous faux pas. This is something that's that's very uh, it's against the law. You could be permanently deleted if you're caught. And it's just this giant society taboo is to dual sleep and that means you download your consciousness into two bodies and i thought it was kind of funny that they that they did the joel kinnaman trick for both where they create an insta clone i mean like the clone that's basically made in like in like four hours or something like that with like an erector set um, and that's how you had two Joel Kinnamans. whereas in the book he's just got like a super hardcore ninja synth sleeve um, and that's how they split up the duties between the two characters. And I think even that would have helped just again reinforce this is a character who's used to this. It can be very dis disorienting and, and disconcerting for normal people to be forced into a new body. 
but this is someone who's trained, who's drilled, who's who's operated, and, and it's a major part of his soldier identity is to tactically quickly get acclimated to a new body. But then at the end, he supposedly died. His mm -hmm. body dies with mm -hmm. the crash, but yet they made him another one exactly yeah. the same. And I, then they I, had I, to choose which because, one of the two stacks was going to live. Well, well was, because because the stacks are still there, but in the book, the the Takeshi body, the Riker's sleeve, um, still goes off to uh, have a fling with the uh, the meth's wife, Miriam Bancroft, <laughs> and then the synth is the one that goes to confront Rylean. I should probably mention that we're well into spoiler territory at this point. <laughs> right? If you yeah. decided that you you wanted to read this book, still. see, um, but you know, you know, the things so. I I actually prefer they was a clone, not a synth. Um, because on. <laughs> no, no, be, because you know, like I love that that part where they just went rock paper scissors. They're like, he's lived longer. I've already experienced some of this stuff. So oh, no, no, no. I mean, uh, the, yeah. they still have that moment in the book because the stacks are this. The stack from the dead synth is recovered. The synth goes to confront Rylene and ends up killing Rylene. Yeah. But they recover his his stack. stack. And so then Riker's sleeve was off with Miriam and it, they still have to have that showdown. No, does, no, I, I, I get that the part. Synth stack stay or does the 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 version of Takeshi in Riker's sleeve does that one get to stay I, I think so, I think for the audience this goes back to that whole audience thing mm -hmm. because you clone the body it's now human right people at least will understand that aspect so a synth is you know I mean it's synthetic you already you know like that's what the mindset would say I I, right. I I I think most audiences will go okay he made two versions of himself so he has to decide which. No, was I, I, I think it was just this was another abbreviation. This is one of those creative storytelling uh, cheats, where I don't think the producers, as we're rolling into the finale, peak of the conflict, peak of the storytelling, peak of the action. I don't think they wanted to push pause to explain. Yeah, that I agree. Takeshi was in a synth sleeve. And that there was another copy of Takeshi that was going to to go and visit with Miriam. No, I, I do I do agree because they only touched they talked about synth technically once when uh when the black guy's name his daughter jumped into a synth. Pretty much they never really explained synths properly. Right. Yeah, so, she jumped into that sleeve and then she starts to look like her. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. But that the problem is that was too late within the episodes for you to start making explanations about synths. Yeah, it's it's too it's well, too far to go back. At the well, they yeah. missed their opportunity with when uh, uh, what's his face, uh, the actor who was in that episode of TNG from the 22nd century, who came forward and posed like he was from the 26th. Oh yeah, and from Eureka yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah. He like they missed their opportunity with him because his body was a synth, and he could have been like, well, I'm showing off this product, blah 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 blah. But it was just they kind of used it for visual, uh, visual accoutrement to the scene, to the whole gladiatorial mm -hmm. scene. So. No, that 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 is true. I, I would agree, but I mean, I to me, I, I like the fact that it was it was two version, real versions of him, not one soul version with a synthetic body. Because so, I just I just felt that it was yeah. I mean, I, like he had I, to. Decide. I like I I like their solution. I'm not saying it's it's not a good solution to have a clone because we've already been introduced to clones. Yeah, all of the all of the meths in this society have all the rich folks themselves you know, all, all the rich folks get their own designer clones um, i mean jesus the sister had a whole bunch until you know ortega <laughs> took them out yeah, no, that scene that scene had the worst slide ever though i loved it like yeah it was it the uh, who the f are you awkward pause nobody and I just, yeah. I just laughed and clapped at the screen awkwardly during that because it was, it was so epically awkward that that I just enjoyed it immensely. But the sister is the one who switched bodies like nothing. Yeah, yeah. Well, because she wanted to again, she was, body she for was, a second. She was trained in the same way. We got a better sense of that from her. Um, Rylene as the sister than we did from Takeshi, and that's supposed to be Takeshi's mo. Yeah, the sister, you know, she was, I believe, the black gentleman. Then she was one of the party goers. Mm -hmm. And then I'm not too sure, but did she play one of the 
sisters to I Bancroft's do family them. member. I do remember them revealing it. There was that one scene. Again, there are so many great moments like blink and you miss it. There was that one scene where they they literally triple, you know, like they divided the screen into thirds to show you the three people that we had been introduced to that were following Takeshi that she yeah. was actually in their sleeve the whole time. Um, which, again, I, I feel if we had also doubled down on Takeshi having a similar experience then i don't think it would have been so scary to have another actor playing takeshi in at the in the end sequence it's just i think it was it was an abbreviation it was an easy way to keep the audience on board with joel kinnaman who we'd all we'd all gotten used to over see i i disagree though i i think i think this is where the show realized understood the limitations of monday audiences i don't think if you had four or five if the more actors you threw in the the More weirder it got for yeah just for today's audiences uh, and sorry i'm calling well, people up i'm well, just calling everybody well, out. the thing is the show's already asking a lot of us i don't yeah. i don't disagree with you i'm just saying if there had been an investment because the the one thing i do have a problem with is the notion that the sleeve could just be sort of like cobbled together minutes before the grand finale there, no, there, dude man, come on yeah. Look, dude this is this is 300 years in the future i buy that i i i don't <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, but it is, dude. It, look, if you can needle cast to another galaxy, come on. Right? No, I don't have any problems with data transmission. We've been working <laughs> oh. with data transmission since radio. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're you're needle casting a whole soul. That no, is, I know. That, that is that, petrobite that some data. But, that doesn't but, make but, sense. <laughs> but growing functional muscle and a skeletal system and a neurology and in a brain and connecting all of those pieces together. No, no. To to me, so, to me, that is the easiest part because it's physical. <laughs> we downloading that body, making sure that it acclimatizes to the soul, to the body I'll, itself, I'll, and I'll then linking say, everything. I'll just have to say, agree to disagree, good sir. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I, I, I feel I feel the wetware is 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 more <laughs> difficult than than the information. Um, we, we do have a. This is a great question. I want to throw it out to each of you uh, from Ganzi Tech Nerd, also joining the conversation in the live chat on YouTube. If cortical stacks and sleeves, uh, including cloning, become reality in the future, then would all of you clone your own body as a sleeve and reoccupy that, or would you want to occupy a different sleeve? And uh, and Abong, I'm going to start with you. Uh, me, man. Why would I go to something else? Perfection, yeah. Lou. What, what 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 would you do? I'm staying with me. Why do I want something else? I'm the real deal. <laughs> Andrew, what's up? <laughs> I'll stick with myself. Uh, uh, you know, ha have a version of me that that kept the retainer on after the braces. You know. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> me too, man. Oh, God, I'm still I, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't shy away from maybe having a few clones that have, you know, like maybe some close to Superman strength or something like that. Just, <laughs> just say, but it's still gonna look like you know me in the first place. <laughs> right. No, I, I, I'm pretty comfortable in my own skin, but I would love to vacation in other bodies i just don't know that i'd want to live there you yeah because then you pick up their habits and all that other crap so i don't know <laughs> well that's what i'm saying is like you know when when i when i travel to a trade show in europe I, i'm confronted with european culture and european uh, social mores and and like for a week i you know i'm trying not to be the obnoxious and rude american and i kind of feel like you could literally pull off that you don't understand another person until you walk a mile in their shoes. <laughs> if I want to know, if I want to understand, if I want to see where people are coming from, like that's the best way to go native. I would love to vacation that way. I think it would help broaden my horizons before I came back and uh, got back to being me again. Now, now here's the question I actually want to pose to all of you, uh, because this is something that the show does. The show and the book does differently from the Commonwealth saga is, um, would you want to live that law? Like if Commonwealth Saga allows everybody to do that in the Commonwealth Saga. And of course, mm -hmm. in Ultra Carbon, there is the financial wealth factor. So if you're rich enough, yes, you can. If you're not rich enough, then you have to go through all these different bodies. And there's also the corruption that happens when you don't stay yeah. in your own. So eventually you will die. Um, but if you could, with your own clones, would you want to live forever? Why not? Well, okay, we'll answer that question. Andrew, what do you think? Um, you know, from a 
being a history nerd for me, I would you know being the the idea of being able to to look back on an experience, my life experience from say two hundred years afterward is really intriguing. However, I'd probably actually not just because on more philosophical side of it, it makes me appreciate the time that I would have already. Like, you know, with my, with my first sleeve, my original sleeve. (laughs) (laughs) I'll, I'll admit, I, I definitely have this burning fear of missing out over future things that probably won't happen in my lifetime. And I think if someone were to confront me with the possibility of immortality, as long as I could choose some point to check out, like when the novelty's worn off and I feel like I've experienced everything I need to experience and I can push a button and quietly and peacefully sort of evaporate from this plane of existence, then I, I would probably ride that existence for really long. <laughs> okay. You know the easy uh, out is just blow your neck out. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, dude. Thanks, thanks no, for reminding us about that. Because no, because they, they they mention this in the book. It's those little character details in both the book and the show where Lawrence Bancroft, everyone the the police have assumed he's committed suicide. Um, again, like I said, we're we're well into spoilers, and I'm not going to completely wreck the the full unraveling of what happens to these Mets. But I love that both the book and the show still still make it even with this guarantee that you can come back because Lawrence Bancroft can can is is like saved. He's got like a backup on an archive on a NAS on some cloud server somewhere. <laughs> um, Just said a NAS on a cloud server. Even with that, it's still in this society a difficult act. You know, because you don't know. There is no guarantee. You don't know if someone's going to find your stack or recover you or something might happen and you accidentally damage your stack or something like that. That, you know, it it, it's not something that they take lightly. And I think there would be a fear. I I think it's one of the things that that doesn't make uh, like Dollhouse as effective is that the stakes don't feel as high, even though it's the same idea it's the same storytelling construct and altered carbon you would worry that because you're this your consciousness is on this little puck at the base of your spine well then nbd like nothing should really make you afraid but they've created social barriers they've created economic barriers they've created spiritual barriers where there's like a a new flavor of catholicism which tries to keep dead people dead because the this commentary on what is the soul and what is your consciousness yeah but that's a very good point but that's a very good point though because i think if that ever happened, that would naturally also happen too. Mm-hmm. Because there are a lot of people who go, well, you know, depending on my religious beliefs, I, I've spent my time and it's time yeah. for me to go. Or even people who just say like, I'm limiting my kids or future generations if I stay too long. Well, and and I, and I think the show does a good job of visually representing this, whereas the book is more exhaustive. Like the book has moments where it's a little bit of a chore to get through the description of the world that they're in. And I think that's by design. I think it's with purpose. Um, but that a society where people could potentially live forever and where even if you're not really living throughout this this time, you can bring people back. Like you could bring gra- your great, 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 great grandmother back to, to visit family members and then just put her back into storage if, if you wanted to. That when I when I originally saw the description on Altered Carbon, a lot of people were saying it's a dystopian future. And I kept thinking, well, why is it a dystopia if there's this wonderful potential that people could live forever? I mean, this should be utopian, if anything. But the way that the book actually executed is we see a society that's basically stopped. Like society can't grow if meths are in charge of everything and they're going to be in charge of everything and they've been in charge of everything for hundreds of years and they can't even let their own kids who are in their 60s and 70s and 80s grow up like they're still petty childish individuals even though they're 70 years old yeah. society is done i mean we've capped it that's it humanity is kind of over even in the face of what would be in today's society considered its greatest achievement well and 
a lot of that downfall too they play up in the show with the fact that people view some people would view these myths as gods even which is you know regressing even more mm-hmm. having to having living gods like the greek gods oh there's a, there's gene roddenberry commentary all over that yeah <laughs> did you, did you, so in the book i want to ask a question in the book um the aliens that they got the technology from to create the stacks did they explore that more? No. Because one of the things. Yeah. So, They're because the Martians. One of the, <laughs> that's it. The what? They're the Martians, and we got it. That's about uh, it. Because one of the things that, <laughs> like, I was hoping for, I was like, maybe they just didn't want to do it in the show, or it's just too much time, or whatever mm-hmm. it was. Um, I was hoping for a point, maybe a second season or third, they talked about um, evolving to a higher state, which is something. Again, I'm sorry. I'm going to bring uh, Commonwealth Saga into this. It's it's in it's in there, you know. And human beings, and that's how that kind of solves that problem of pro- moving forward as a society. Because certain people will still leave, even though they're around, but they've gone to a different level. And then you know, other people will move to the next level and things like that. And, and I was expecting at some point that there would be. Do you guys remember that there was an episode of Black Mirror? Um, I think it was the one that won an Emmy. I don't watch Black Mirror. Anyway, oh, so there's, there's an episode of, of Black Mirror where, again, spoilers, if you haven't watched like season three of Black Mirror, um, but there's an episode where as... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the, the, yeah. San Junipero, is that San what Junipero, it? yes. Yeah. Yes. And so I was expecting at some point in Altered Carbon that there would be like a digital retirement home. So you weren't going to get re-sleeved ever again, but you could live safely in some sort of, you know, digital construct or world or something. Exactly. <laughs> because, yeah. So they had their own oasis. Well, yeah, like the yeah. oasis. Yeah, oasis, definitely. Yeah. Something, something like that, too. Um, no, like what, what's kind of funny, E, when we bring up the differences between the book and the show, I think even though it it shortcuts a lot of character exposition and it radically changes what the envoy were and what um excuse me what the role Takeshi's sister plays I think the show does a better job of ushering you into the whole world um the book doesn't hold your hand through any world building exercises and immediately thrusts you into a film noir pulp mystery and the book spends most of its time focused on the mystery to the detriment of the world that the mystery is in. So I don't think the mystery is as effective in the show, but I ultimately think the show is more fun because we get the hard sci-fi grounding in all of the tech, all of the science, and how that does impact the storytelling elements for for the mystery. I mean, you got I, a killer think- hotel. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. That is true. I, I love the changes of the hotel and, and from the show, from the book to the show. Uh, I think the show handled. I, I really enjoy how the show handled. Well, the, the show the gave hotel. the hotel more of a personality. Yeah, it gave yeah. it gave it an actual three dimensional character. That that was that was a very good ploy. I like I like that part with it. I mean, but think I think about it. the the show did. It took because you said the, in the book it was called the Lenny Kravitz Hotel. Oh, no, 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 it was the Hendrix. The Jimi Hendrix Hotel. So that's a rock and roll hotel. Yeah. What is, like, does he get attacked in the hotel? Oh, yeah. In the book? It's the same moment from the book, yeah. So the Jimi Hendrix Hotel had machine, well, those nice Gatling guns come down and Mm -hmm. and lay into people. Well, then that might have been fun playing with some rock and roll. Oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Andrew. Sorry. Uh, I was going to say, I was reading up on this, and essentially what the, the showrunner was saying was there are a lot of – the, the Hendricks estate is very particular about the level – like uh, what like violence mm-hmm. is associated yeah. with, with, with their product. So uh, so they with decided – The product with, with like the image and legacy of Jimmy Hendrix. Right, exactly. Yeah. You know. Well, and, and, uh, and so they decided – they made a conscious, conscious decision, decision to go as far away from that as possible in, uh, you know, Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> well, no, I, actually, sure. this is something or I really They just didn't about. want a paycheck. Well, you, I, I definitely think that there could have been a dollar amount that they could have arrived at to keep it. But why? This is one of the things that I think is is kind of beautiful from the show. Again, the, the production design and the writing team and 
all of the Netflix influence on creating a piece of media, you've got a problem. The net, the Jimi Hendrix estate doesn't want Gatling guns mowing people down in the name of Jimi Hendrix. And they, they come up with the solution of making the Raven hotel based on a construct of Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe is largely credited with writing the very first incarnation of the modern detective story, the murders of the Rue Morgue. Um, wonderful, wonderful story, flipping amazing. And it's so far ahead of its time. So why not pay homage to that in a future pulp detective mystery thriller? You know, why not go back to the very first author, you know, United States author, uh, the, the first time we saw, you know, a detective story at play like that. And, and so I like, what a wonderful little touch for a TV show, normally something that would have been a throwaway moment or a throwaway character, they actually thought about the solution that they needed to personify this hotel as a character. And I thought it was gorgeous what they came up with. Mm -hmm. I, I would definitely agree. I, I think it goes just going back to the point about touches and and little things that actually jump out in the show. I think they did a good job overall of just trying to give you the, some of those moments where you go, huh. Um, and I think for anyone who is watching, still watching, or will watch the show, whatever the case may be, is it's one of those shows that you just pay attention. You mm -hmm. know, um, you pay attention because little things will pop up and you would go, oh, Oh snap! Okay, so this okay, I, I, you know this makes sense, and I like that about the show. It's it's one of those that you not that you necessarily have to be completely glued, but you just have to be ready to embrace everything it gives you. Oh, dude, yeah. I mean, you had to embrace the fact that the military guy he got his wife back, but she was a man, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, and and he was all for it, like, yo. Yes, honey. Whatever, baby. Like, yo, he ain't care. I, I'm I was glad you. I would have been like, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, but it's a hard process. It is a hard process, though. And and they played that. I think they played that well enough. Where they, you know, part of him was like, no, but I know my wife's in there, and mm -hmm. that is my wife. But that's not my wife. Society, that's that's at least a little bit more familiar with these types of shenanigans. It's not just out of the blue. Yeah, exactly. So it was it was it was um it was it was nice to see, I would say. Like like if, if Marie just came home like her mind in the body of some guy, I feel like that would be a bigger shock for me that I would work to get over because my wife is my favorite person on the planet. Um but if I lived in a society where body swapping happened on the regular, it wouldn't be as difficult, I think, an, an idea to get over. Uh, 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 as long as you weren't like uh, Otega's mom. <laughs> right. Well, it's like I, I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, sort of recovering Catholic. So I think, yeah. uh, again, I'd still be able to. And to me, that was that was like a bittersweet moment because. That was her mother. Yeah. You know, and just to spend time with her. And and she just couldn't overcome that mm -hmm. to spend time with her mother. What, what, and again, what we're talking about is is Ortega's family is this new Catholic breed, which they are uh, vehemently opposed to. See, I, would, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't call it new Catholic. I would just call it standard, literally. I, yeah, because, yeah. Well, I'm, see, I'm saying the they're, 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 like, they're, they're one step removed from, like the author in the book is one step removed from just calling them space Catholics. You know? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what you do in sci-fi is you're just like, oh, it's, 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 it's a Martian Catholic. Um, yeah, but, but this is, this is again, for as much as as much information as we go through in the book the show does a better job of giving us that human moment with ortega that ortega isn't just a damsel in distress character she's just not in opposition like she's just not a barrier for takeshi to work through we get a family meal like it's not huge that's not a, a massive part of the story it's not a significant part of ortega's character but the show where the book doesn't to the same degree the show actually sits us down for a moment to help flesh out the world and give us some idea of where ortega's coming from and why she's taking this fight so personally and we get to see it through the eyes of her mother and her grandmother like now 
that's a beautiful little moment. Again, something that I don't think the author Richard K. Morgan originally intended to ever give us. And yet the showrunners and show producers for this said, you know what, we're, we're missing a beat here. We're missing, we're missing a motivation here and we can do it in this really simple little beautiful moment to show a family in conflict. Did the book have Ortega take a lot of stacks? Because she seemed to take a lot of stacks in the show. I don't remember. I, I it's it's more that I think Takeshi is pushing her to the limits of being a cop in this futuristic society where everything is shades of gray and people take liberty with their roles of authority. Less that she's you know a, a, a cybernetic one armed killing machine. She's a lot more effective in the show at taking people out than I think she is in the book. Yeah. Yeah, no, she did get the arm in the book as well. No, oh, she's no, 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 she doesn't. Mm -mm. Yeah, no, there's no, there's no uh, big surgery. You know, I, I like, I like that she embraced the upgrade real quick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. After she learned what she could do with that thing, body slam people with one arm. Oh, I was mad. pipes like nothing. I was mad when immediately out of the surgery, she's like, "What did you do to me?" And you're like. No, don't make her mad about this. Don't, don't, don't make this like a plot device. And then, like, literally two scenes later, she's like punching guys' heads through walls. And you're like, yes, yes, you've got a superpower now. Just embrace it. You're gonna have time, uh, especially when she beat up her um her boss. Uh, her boss, like, he came in right in, and she's like, wait, you gave me robotic arm? Yeah, he's like, I'll step outside. <laughs> I love that because he was like, uh, I mean, like without the arm, you could have beaten him anyway. But totally, I think I'm just gonna just walk away from this one at this point. All right, we'll have Stay fun. Away. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did uh, uh, can we all just appreciate that that we got to see the actor who played Hilo from Battlestar and something again? Yeah, I like mean, dude, he's wait, 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 who was that again? Because I'm now I forgot his name. Ugh. Now, now I got to look it up. Hilo from Bottle Star. What? He, he, he was the one. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was the Russian girl. guy. He was the, he was a Russian guy. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. so he was. Yeah. Yeah. He was was... Yeah. Uh, that's right, though. I've not seen him in some other stuff. But... Yeah, he was oh, in yeah. a show called Incorporated, but that got canceled on. Oh, Five yes, Five. Incorporated. I wish. Oh. Have you seen Incorporated, uh, Juan? Oh, I haven't. No, I haven't seen it. You should check Don't it out. Don't waste your I mean, time. It's... No, you should. It's it's canceled, but you enjoy the concept of Incorporated. It was a good show. I thoroughly liked the show, but then, you know, they had to come and cancel it because they don't let shows breathe a season. <laughs> oh, the ratings ain't here. Fine, let's cancel it. No, you asshole. Oops, you were sorry. Let it breathe an extra season. Let it build an audience. Yeah. Get the people invested. You give us a cliffhanger. Like Marco Polo, we'll never know what happened there. Whoa, you're you're the first time I've ever met someone who's who's actually seen Marco Polo too. Oh, we, we've seen Marco Polo. Oh, we enjoyed okay. Marco Polo. We wanted season three. If not season three, give me a movie. Well, I, I, I was just kill it to end it. Because because the actor's name is uh, Tamo Penniket. I've probably just butchered his name, but it was because uh, again. I was stoked to see him in this because he was also one of the leads in Dollhouse. Again, like just floating around the same sort of ideas of science fiction. I, I like it when casting is smart, where you can kind of link, even if it's subconscious, even if it's not out overt. Like the second I saw him, I was like, oh, how hilarious the dude from Dollhouse is in a, a, a Netflix original series where you can upload your consciousness to a computer disc. <laughs> You went with Dahas. I went with Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> oh, I mean, I love him from Battlestar Galactica, but I thought like that's hilarious. Is is, is what like what a funny little psychological twist where let's say you have an idea for who you want your audience for a show like this to be. And I think, the, you know, Netflix executives sitting down and saying like, you know, if someone enjoyed a show like Dollhouse, this is going to be right up their alley, too. Hey, I wonder what the guy from Dollhouse is doing. Can we book him? <laughs> Not to make him the main character, but just to sneak him in there. And if you had any like warm, fuzzy feelings about Dollhouse like I did, then, you know, like just wedge him in there and you can. Sure, just come on in. You will die in the first episode, but 
Hey, at least you got a roll for a day. <laughs> it's a paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's it's uh, you know they played down Cabin's character. I feel like in the in the show versus in the book. In the book, he was almost uh, since uh, Kawahara was basically absent for two thirds of the book. Uh, uh, Cabman was really more of the nemesis character for Kovach than, than Karahara was yeah. uh, from my view anyway. And well, yeah. And they made him a lot more freaky of a, of a, of a scary of a character. Who's more of a boogeyman. Yeah. Yeah. I think for season two, the villain or the antagonist is going to be the cop at oh, the beginning that was chasing okay. him because Oh. You hype him up in the earlier episodes, and then he just disappears. Oh, you so, mean he's, uh, he's a recruiter at... Uh, yeah, the, the guy who recruited him to be in the military. Uh, yeah, that's, hmm. not, that's a good idea. So, and that's a, well, that's a good martial arts actor, though. He's, um, well, he's, and this is also where, like, for the Geek Book Club, we need to do a better job of actually reading the full series of books, <laughs> <laughs> not just the first <laughs> book in the series. No, but no, but it's great, though. We don't spoil anything for anyone and the show. Right. Well, and, and I, I still like holding to spoiler-free commentary as much as I can. I mean, I, I kind of broke my own rule on this one. Um, but that's one <laughs> well, of the things kind of hard to you guys. Was, to uh, talk about a show without spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, like I, I feel like if one of the problems I have and why I like Enabong and, and Lou, why I like the way that you guys talk about things. And I think it's one of the reasons why I like having you guys on for our show, too, is. I, I don't enjoy plot regurgitation movie and show podcasts where it's like and then this happens and then he says this and then he goes to this bar and then he gets information from an informant and you're like. I was watching, I was listening to one podcast where the podcast was longer than the film they were reviewing. <laughs> <laughs> and their only analysis and commentary basically boiled down in the last five minutes of their show as to whether or not they liked it and they gave it thumbs up, thumbs down awards. Okay, okay. Like, to be to be fair. And I could to have them. just watched the movie <laughs> faster. <laughs> Than I, listening I, to their show where they as were... I laugh I, to be fair I have done a a spoiler review that is almost as long as the movie <laughs> but to be fair uh it was interstellar and Sam and I got into a discussion and geeked out about well, well but that's just it. about space travel yeah. uh, quantum quantum dimensions and we started talking about fourth fourth dimensional worlds so that was a little <laughs> different did they want you guys the folded paper folded uh, paper and pencil analogy with it <laughs> <laughs> um no see that that's that's what I actually like is if you get sidetracked and you can go off I mean think about there, there, you know, it's a 10 episode Netflix series. It's a 500 page novel. And you, we, we should be able to talk for hours about that kind of content without ever just giving you the cliff notes, you know, regurgitation. Uh, I'm reading off the Wikipedia and then this happens. And then this guy does this and then that happens. And then you say that. And then he goes through a wall. Like that's boring. It's so boring. So uh, one of the things that I, I kind of want to throw out there, because we haven't read the second book, and and there is some buzz, even though the initial response to the Altered Carbon TV show was a little mixed. Um, it, it wasn't a smashing, crazy, everybody had to watch it kind of success. But I think this is a show that's going to long tail really mm -hmm. well for Netflix. I think it's going to find an audience. I think uh, fans of harder science fiction are going to gravitate to this and share it with their family and friends. It's not like it's going to be cult, but it's going to follow the same sort of audience building. Um, we're already starting to see people posting stories. Do we think Jason Kinnaman should come back? Or is it Jason Kinnaman? I've already forgotten his name. Uh, the main character. Kinnaman is his last yeah. name. That's his last name. What's his first name? John. John Kinnaman, I think it is. Uh, I can't remember. Did, did you, so the question Joel, is, do you think you... Joel, it's Joel, another Joel. J name. <laughs> um, so, so some of the stories are pointing to whether or not the producers of this show, when we're pretty confident that Takeshi is not going to stay on Earth, that that's not what the future holds for Takeshi at the end of both the book and of the TV show. But now people are saying, well, how do we work Joel Kinnaman into a season two? 
Um, I, I think from the way they ended it, because you know she was giving, he was giving the body back to um, Ortega's boyfriend, um, mm-hmm. Riker. Like it should go back to Riker, yeah. R- Riker. I think. I think. And and so this is the two parts of my answer. Oh. One, one. I think that yes, they should transition him over, maybe just for those hand holding audiences, um, which is quite a lot, just to get some of that through. Uh, the other half also depends on his movie shooting schedule as well. <laughs> That's this all has to do with Suicide Squad, which will probably start shooting at the end of this year. Yeah, and, see, that's a good point too. Yeah. If this does become a hit, Netflix can't afford to lose them. You think so? You don't think that this because the audience can live? The I audience don't... will want him, and I don't think they would be ready for a new actor to play the role. No, I see. I, I disagree with that because I think, like Juan said, this is a long tail show. Now, it's not going to be a, it's not an instant hit. This show is going to benefit from um, Lost in Space because yeah. Netflix is going to just go tag this as because you watch Lost in Space, you're watching this next. But it's not it's, it's going to be a hit long term, which means People are like, well, that's a good show. Doesn't mean that I am tied to Joe Kellerman as as the actor. I think what they need to do is they need to take what you said, Juan, and said, take him back to his roots of jumping from body to body. What's his next adventure, right? We'd have not read the book. So if he starts to, if he jumps to maybe another recognizable actor, he still has his main body, you know, he's got his body back. And then we now have his different bodies or these two bodies and the main actor from this, I mean, his main body from the first season. Then we have that transition on, and then people now go, fuck it, man, you can go anywhere with this yeah. at this point. You know? like, and, and Andrew, do you think that turning this into more of an anthology? Like, um, I, I mean, I think it would benefit from it. I mean, it's, it's kind of, think of it kind of like, uh, I guess each season you'd have, depending on how the books go, uh, obviously, but like you would think it's kind of like the, the Doctor Who, you know, where where you you right. switch out, and it's and I'm more personally attached. If if we have to say sleeves for Kovacs that we're attached to, I'm more attached to his original sleeve. As, as that's exactly as the character. comment that just popped up in the live chat from Eric Drummond. Like, if oh, you yeah? do anything, you should just go to his original body and and have the, give that actor a run. Right. I, I mean, I think I think that would. I mean, they we spent enough time examining his backstory that that's just who I imagine him. Kovac as uh, right. more than anything. Well, and, and <sighs> still what's effective is is we what I love, the audience is going to sort of gravitate. It, it's funny that you say it that way, Andrew, because we know that that was his original self. And so that's who we imagine being in Joel Kinnaman's frame. But the show still has plenty of room left to explore these concepts of who are you like we have to use flashbacks and exposition storytelling devices to introduce you to the history of kovach but that's still that that body isn't kovach kovach is the consciousness on a disc so what if what if season two starts off or even half of season two he is body jumping he remember this is only season one was basically let's call it a year. It's probably not even that long. But let's call season one a year of him coming back to life from 250 years in jail. Before that, he was used to running missions, jumping in bodies, nil casting everywhere. And that's what he's used to. Maybe that itch comes back, or maybe that's just part of what happens after he's solved this case. Uh, that he is now jumping from body to body. See, um, I, I love that idea because that's what I feel like we should have gotten just a little bit more sense of in this first season was seeing that kind of shift. I, I for me, I think it's a bad idea. It's not, not, not to beat you up too much, Lou, cause it's now like three on one. And so I guess you're democratically wrong. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, Hey, if that's what happens, that's what happens. Can't well, be right all the time. Somehow I've managed to make it this far in life, pretty much always being correct. Um, but the, the, the one way that I would love to see them bring Joel Kinnaman back though, is if we get a relationship with Riker. The person yeah. who originally owned that sleeve, and I think ah uh, yes, yes, yeah. You could bring Kinnaman back to play the character of the consciousness that originally inhabited that body, and I think we could do something really interesting, even if it's not a part of the future books. I think that could be 
a really interesting way to have that actor involved with the project again. But see, there's there's a problem with what Eric just said. He got the dragon tattoo. So what? <laughs> uh, so now, so so um, Ortega's past boyfriend when he comes back, he's gonna go. What the hell is this shit? And get it erased? Yeah, yeah. It's the future. You can get it <laughs> as as quickly yeah. as laser stitches it was on. It will be laser erased off. Totally. <laughs> I mean, if Remember, we can believe if we can believe that a clone can be built in like 37 minutes in an easy bake oven, then yeah, I don't think that's yes, a big problem. Yes, it can. If you and, and I want to bring this back, this is this is from the live chat a little while ago. We should probably start wrapping the show up, but I, I feel like one of the most appropriate ideas to leave with is from Tech Leathercraft in the live chat. Juan has a point. And this is why I'm bringing up this comment. Anytime you start a comment with Juan is right, I'm going to read your comment live on the uh, I read it and I, sk- I stopped. Uh, Juan has a point. <laughs> you jerk. Uh, Juan has a point. Since the son was trying to create a clone of Lawrence Bancroft, and that seems to be taking forever. Remember when they break into his house, they find that half-made clone. So... They show in the show like this rich and powerful kid, the son of Lawrence Bancroft, didn't have a finished clone ready to go. Yeah, but he but he had a clone that he used. But he had a clone that he used on his dad. I don't think that was necessarily what. But I think he just had one of his dad's clones. Clones. He was trying to make his own custom order daddy clone. Maybe maybe it's something of him not cloning himself. You know, I mean, I'm just saying, like, if you're. Yeah, it could be I'm, just I'm f- willing to extend that the show doesn't do a good job <laughs> answering that. But I still hold <laughs> to the idea that growing a fully formed human I, adult I, mature I am sitting clone down isn't... here having having an argument <laughs> with with my my dude about cloning an easy big oven for 37 minutes. And I contend that if you can cast your soul to a different galaxy, how many million light years away? Come on, like we can just I'm, 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 we well, can wait. skip that. Here's the other thing, though. Like, <laughs> if, if cloning and 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 making another sleeve is so easy, why why do we get seven year old girls and seventy year old bodies then? Well, and it's and very they expensive. Were no, 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 because it's very expensive. Oh, and that right, 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 right. Raylene's line actually, I think, answers that pretty well. When we have the the sort of inconsequential, let's just kill uh, Kawahara a bunch of times scene, <laughs> where <laughs> it's it's then uh, sort of alluded to that this was a very expensive, an extremely yeah. expensive loss on her part to to glue so many clones. Um, but I, I think that's probably as good a place to end it as any. I just kind of want to do a quick, uh, just a quick down the line. Um, like we would for reviewing the book, this is for me, this is something I'm happy to recommend with the caveat that you kind of need to give it the first three episodes. And Abong, if you were to pitch this show to one of your friends, how would you describe uh, the, the viewing experience? Um, you, you said it well, and it's actually a pitch I gave to a friend of mine uh, just to I know it's, I'm sounding going a little longer here. He um, he actually knows the cinematographer of the show, oh. and so he was really excited. And he was like, you know, I went to watch this. I went to his house for a viewing party, and I didn't like it. I thought it was terrible. And I I told him same thing you said: give it a couple of episodes to get into it, and you will enjoy the show. And he came back and said, "Wow, it's pretty good." So I'm and like, Lou, uh, what 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 do you pitch this show as? If you were trying to convince someone to watch it, how would you? I don't pitch. I tell you, watch it. If you don't watch it, that's on you. Don't come for <laughs> me and ask me. You got any good shows to watch? I just gave you one. You didn't watch it. That's on you. <laughs> I love it. Well, and and Andrew, one of the things that I was sort of teasing while we were reviewing the book is between the books extreme focus on the murder mystery and the show's larger and broader focus on the world building how do you think the two properties complement each other oh i mean i think they i mean gosh they complement each other it's 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 almost like a yin, yin and yang in my sort of opinion like i've suggested this to to other people uh, since i finished it and i've said like you should really read the book too to kind of get the whole the over the the narrative as a whole from like all sorts of angles uh 
I really think that that you benefit more from experiencing both. Really, see, this is where I differ. Hmm. I did that with The Walking Dead. Not- and the Walking <laughs> Dead is a pile of horse crap. No, Which see, so I agree. I agree with you in that this this isn't always going to be true. Normally, I'm a book or film kind of guy, and this is one of the few times where the changes between the book and the show are significant, but I don't feel they compete against each other like the changes from The Walking Dead do. Oh God! Don't get me started on that crap. I, I mean, feel because... like we would need at least another three hours of just oh yeah, yeah. horrific because... ranting and gnashing of teeth. I, I could just tell you the governor in the comic book is Danny Trejo, <laughs> not who we got on the screen. Now, now, to be fair, I love the actor that they cast for the governor. But you're you're right. If you're going to start straying from the original source material and how you introduce new characters and the the portrayal of those characters. Um, I think Altered Carbon did a phenomenally good job of almost matching character for character who I had in my mind's eye when I was reading the book. Um, very, very like, you know, the, the minor differences uh, who, uh, you guys know the, I've already forgotten his name again. The actor who plays, um, in a Captain America winter soldier, Frank Grillo. Frank Grillo. Frank Grillo, mm. um, you knew exactly what I was talking about. That's kind of who I had in my brain for the sleeve that Takeshi occupies. And Joel Kinnaman, like, is just taller. Like, <laughs> good, like that was a great job. Ortega, spot on. Um, oh, Kawahara, yes, even though the book is, the character is so much different in the book than in the TV show, I wasn't imagining an actress like who they cast for, for Rylene. Like, Point to point, I, I really felt like they tapped into sort of my brain as the casting director to 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 nail the look and feel of this show. Um, no, I, I, I think this is one of the few examples I would point to. I would put it up there with an adaptation like Shawshank Redemption in that the book and the film for Shawshank complement each other beautifully. Here, the differences are extreme between the book and the TV show. But hand in hand, you get way more pulp murder mystery film noir out of the book and you get way better sci-fi out of the tv show and even though the the stories stray significantly i think they they lock together fairly well but then that's when you know you're doing something right yeah oh Mm -hmm. totally definitely unlike you know the walking dead we're gonna draw out a season (laughs) because we want to they draw out well, every if you really think about it, to. bro. 12 yeah. issues can be your season. Oh, yeah. No, mm-hmm. every every episode of The Walking Dead should be one comic. Easy. Oh, and, and you can make your changes because, like, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put a cap on that because, like I said, if we go down that route, yeah. this becomes a four hour <laughs> podcast, and I'd like to let you guys get because it's I it's it's you know, I'm on the west coast, so I'm I'm getting off easy in, in doing the show. <laughs> Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, boys and girls, sci-fi fans, geeks, and geekettes alike, uh, Altered Carbon is something that I was very surprised. The more I've gotten away from both the book and the show, the more it's resonated and the more I've appreciated this as an adaptation, let alone two individual pieces of art, uh, a book and and uh, a 10-episode series on Netflix. So I really am hoping that we will get a follow-up, a companion to this, a season two and and it's it is encouraging me to continue reading the Takeshi novels, even if before I'd finished the show, the novel had left me feeling like there were a few missed opportunities. The show seems to have filled in some of those gaps for me, which is a wonderful turn of events. Um, uh, Enabong and Lou, where can people catch your escapades on uh, continued conversations with comics and movies and other things geek? Uh, yes, you can uh, check us out at on board. Uh, we are currently restructuring our <clears throat> sorry <laughs> our superhero hour, um, which we talk about comic book movies, TV shows, and news. So that will be coming back in uh, at least I'll say a couple of weeks. So that will be two maximum. Um, and uh, on board is that on board is a YouTube channel. Onboard is a YouTube channel, yes. And also you can follow us on our Instagram channel, Onboard, where Lou runs that with an iron fist. 
Yeah. And, uh, and of course, you know, put some very interesting and fun, fun posts up there for you guys to check out. And we got a discord. We're working on that one too. Yes. Oh, very cool. So a little Thanks. live chat action also. Excellent. Nice. Cause I know it's one of the things like I'm, I'm terrible. Like there, there was some great discussion happening in the live chat for us during this episode. And, and like, I, I, well, I normally monitor the live chat, but this wasn't my show, so <laughs> no, 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 no. it's not on you. It's it's totally on me. It's like I need to find that split it, focus where I'm trying to think of what's the next question I want to ask you guys. Oh, they just said something really cool in the live chat. What was I gonna say? I don't remember. No, no, I don't. I don't blame you, Juan. I mean, like even on my show, you're the one who handles the live chat. I do so. <laughs> Well, and, and that's also the other thing too. In, in talking about all things tech, definitely check out Board at Work and his uh, and, and a bunk weekly podcast there too. The uh, the Board at Work uh, weekly, where uh, I, I I tend to also join that conversation also because I just like talking about stuff with you guys. Of course, you can catch Andrew uh, around the internet at Fat Produce. He's also the one who's running our Geek Book Club Instagram, where he's been going out and finding some treasures, some gems of old Star Trek cover art. Oh, and yeah. Comics and oh, I've got one. I've got a couple of niche style comics where they've actually mashed up images from the show and put them in and like re-edited them as part of the comic, but uh, it's live action. Really fascinating. So I'm gonna go take a closer look at those and uh, here here in the next couple of days and and posting that content on there for you guys. Definitely. And and this is something we're hoping to do a little bit more of in addition to uh, the book reviews. Because for example, next uh, for for March we're gonna be reading Writing Player One, and at the end of the uh, the end of the month, you know, Andrew's holding it up right there. Uh, at the end of the month, we're also going to have a feature film that we'll be able to compare mm -hmm. to that book. And I think, oh, like boy. we were saying at the beginning, we're all a little concerned about the traditional route that books will be adapted into a feature film. Off rip. <clears throat> yeah. The book curses. The movie's PG. <laughs> so you're losing some of that a excitement flavor, right. that he brings when he says certain words. And I mean, it gets with the words. I was like, whoa, I didn't expect this. Yeah. <laughs> Lou sent me a message like, Dear Kirsten, a lot. I was like, oh, yeah, did you, did you. Lou is a very sensitive soul, as you'll find. And... <laughs> no, 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 no. I felt right at home with the words. It was just, I thought it was a children's book. Well, and, and this is this is one of the things. So, so my, okay. To, to cap up the cap off this show, because again, I don't want to run us too long, and we could spend uh, like two hours speculating on uh, Ready Player One. My hypothesis for what Juan's going to be cranky about way too much of the adventure is going to be abbreviated and i worry about the scope of a director paying homage to himself so much of ready player one is a love letter to 1980s pop culture that steven spielberg was a member of the zeitgeist of creating that media and i worry that he he will lack the perspective to pat himself on the back appropriately for a movie while also sacrificing major plot elements because we just have to come in under a certain time. See, I think uh, this movie would have benefited from splitting it. I absolutely agree. Mm. This, this, to, the book for me reads in two very distinct sections and two very separate chapters. And I think there's a natural break point in the book that would have made an exciting cliffhanger for a uh, era. I, I will say this quickly because uh, I know somebody, Warren's cousin, was in the movie um, and he's read the book and he's basically told me that it is just not the same thing. It's not even an homage issue. There are just whole changes that are different. Well, and there's, and a lot, there's a lot of time spent in the real world. I, well. I can I can appreciate because again the the whole conversation that we have an adaptation is a new piece of art we need to let go of every mo like the frustration I have with like uh, Ender's Game again I I worry that I'm going to be walking into this or The Walking Dead is another perfect example I love the comics I walk into the TV show of The Walking Dead with an expectation built on my 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 fandom my fanboy f a n b o i ness for for that comic 
you've called this ready player one. So I am willing to go with you on significant changes as long as core elements of the adventure remain intact. If you stray too far from that, why didn't you just call this generic virtual reality battle movie number 374? You called it ready player one. You have to be prepared for some level of attachment to the to that title <laughs> see they should have had peter jackson as the executive producer and he would have spun it like yo this needs three movies uh, yeah, exactly <laughs> each movie is gonna have like a three-hour extended cut on he that did. note we got yeah. about <laughs> okay we do we do, we do. Yeah, yeah, i so, actually so, do have to do work Thank you so much for joining us on this supplemental episode of the Geek Book Club. Like I said before, something, if you enjoyed this, please drop us some comments, share this podcast with your family and friends who love good books, good movies, and good TV shows, because we'd like to be covering more of these adaptations, experiments, and the expanded role that uh, both fandom and authorship have on the media that we create and consume these days. So again, thank you so much. You can catch me around the internet at some gadget guy. The geek book club has its own Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook accounts where you can get more information on the books we're going to be reading coming up and definitely check out Anabong and Lou for uh, on board and uh, their superhero hour where they talk about movies and comics and all things geek too. Cause if you liked this show, you're definitely going to like their show too. Uh, thanks so much for watching and don't forget March. We're going to, be wrapping up ready player one and for april uh, just so you can get a leg ahead uh andrew what are we reading for april we are going to be reading master and commander uh by patrick o'brien oh, so nice. you guys i was i thought i had my copy of the book right here but it's somebody else <laughs> but uh <laughs> but uh yes if so if you it's actually uh if any of you guys it's another uh there have been a, there has also been an adaptation made of sorts mm -hmm. made for this where they combine the first book master and commander and the 10th book the far side of the world to make master and commander the far side, far of, the side world. of the world so <laughs> i will not be able to read 10 books to do another episode looking at the book in the movie yeah don't worry because there's there's 20 books actually so. really yeah, there's yeah. twenty, but there's there's a final one. I I don't know. I don't know if it's the twentieth or the twenty first where it wasn't finished because the the author died. So I'm still struggling to keep up with our normal show schedule, and I'm also paging through the uh, the second book in the three bo three body problem series. So it's going to take me a long while to get through twenty books, and I don't yeah. need to uh, see that. See, that. that is where it should have been turned into television. Yeah, mm -hmm. for like a got, horn blower, it's, it's definitely yes. Got the source material right there laid out for them. Yeah, and each chapter of a book is well, each book is a season, and you could do like a twenty episode arc. Anyway, thanks so much, folks, for watching. Uh, we'll be back uh, at the end of the month for Ready Player One. April, we're going to be reading Master and Commander, and uh, we'll catch you all uh, on the next episode of the Geek Book Club. Thanks so much for watching and listening. <laughs>